I never thought I would be the one to tell you this. For decades, I have stood at the intersection of physics and philosophy, asking questions about the cosmos that most people reserve for science fiction. I have spent my life exploring the boundaries of space, time, and consciousness. I have theorized about parallel universes, wormholes, and civilizations millions of years more advanced than our own. But nothing, nothing in my career prepared me for what I learned three months ago in a classified briefing room buried beneath the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. The object we call 3i Atlas is not what we thought it was. But before we begin, I need you to do something for me right now. Comment your city name below. NASA has been tracking reports from all over the world and they need to know where these phenomena are being witnessed. Tell us your location. Tell us if you've noticed anything unusual in the night sky. Anything at all. My name is Michio Kaku, and what I'm about to share may change the way you see humanity's place in the universe. The implications of that realization are so profound, so unsettling, that I have spent every night since then staring at the ceiling of my bedroom, unable to sleep, unable to reconcile what I know with what I believed about our place in this universe. Let me take you back to the beginning. In December of 2019, a robotic telescope in Hawaii detected an anomaly. It was moving fast far too fast to be a comet born in our solar system. The trajectory was wrong. The velocity was wrong. Everything about it defied our models. We named it 3i Atlas, the third interstellar object ever detected passing through our cosmic neighborhood. The first was Oumuamua. The second was Borisov. Both were strange. Both raised questions. But 3i Atlas, 3i Atlas was different. At first, NASA told the public it was just another rogue comet, a wanderer from a distant star system passing through on its way to nowhere. They released statements, they published data, they moved on. But behind closed doors, something else was happening, something they couldn't explain. And when I was invited to consult on the anomaly, when I was shown the data they had been withholding, I felt a chill run through my body that I have never felt before. Because 3i Atlas was not moving like a comet, it was not behaving like a natural object obeying the laws of celestial mechanics. It was adjusting its course, subtly, precisely, as if it were scanning, as if it were mapping. I remember the moment I saw the trajectory analysis. I was standing in front of a wall of monitors surrounded by some of the brightest minds at NASA and no one was speaking. The room was silent, except for the hum of the computers. On the screen in front of me was a three-dimensional map of 3i Atlas's path through our solar system. It had entered from above the ecliptic plane, moving at over 40 kilometers per second. But then, as it passed the orbit of Mars, it slowed, just slightly, just enough to be measurable. And then it changed course, not by much, not dramatically, but enough that every physicist in that room knew this was not gravity. This was not a natural deflection caused by the sun's mass or the pull of a planet. This was intent. One of the lead scientists, a woman I had known for years, turned to me and said something I will never forget. She said, Michio, it's watching us. I wanted to dismiss it. I wanted to tell her she was reading too much into the data, but I couldn't because deep down, I knew she was right. Over the following weeks, NASA deployed every instrument we had, radio telescopes, infrared satellites, deep space probes. We pointed everything at 3i Atlas, trying to understand what it was, where it came from, and what it was doing. And that's when we discovered the emissions. They were faint, almost undetectable, but they were there. Pulses of electromagnetic radiation emanating from the object in patterns that were far too regular to be natural. At first, we thought it might be some kind of outgassing, a release of charged particles as the object heated up near the sun, but the patterns didn't match any known physical process. They were structured, rhythmic, and most disturbingly, they were changing. The team ran the data through every analytical model we had. Fourier analysis, signal processing, machine learning algorithms designed to detect patterns in chaos. And that's when we found it. The emissions weren't random. They were correlating with something, something here, on Earth. At first, we didn't understand what we were looking at. The data seemed impossible. 
But then one of the young physicists on the team, a specialist in neuroscience and quantum information theory, made a connection that sent a wave of disbelief through the entire lab. The pulses from 3i Atlas were matching patterns of human brain activity. Not just any activity. Higher order cognitive functions, language processing, abstract reasoning, consciousness itself. It was mapping us. Not our cities, not our technology. It was mapping the way we think. I stood there staring at the data, my hands trembling, and for the first time in my life, I felt truly small. I have spent decades studying the universe, trying to understand the mind of God, trying to decode the mathematical language in which reality is written. But in that moment, I realized something terrifying. We were not the observers. We were the observed. The implications were staggering. If 3i Atlas was capable of detecting and analyzing human thought patterns from millions of kilometers away, then whoever, or whatever, built it possessed a level of technology so advanced that it would seem like magic to us. We're not talking about a civilization a few hundred years ahead of us. We're talking about a civilization that has mastered the quantum fabric of consciousness itself. A civilization that can read minds across the void of space. But why? Why would they do this? Why send a probe to map the cognitive patterns of a species that, by cosmic standards, has barely emerged from the Stone Age? That was the question that haunted me. That was the question that kept me awake, night after night, pacing the floors of my home, trying to make sense of the senseless. And then, three weeks ago, we received the transmission. It wasn't a message in the traditional sense. It wasn't a signal we could decode into language or mathematics. It was something far more direct, far more intimate. It was a thought or rather, the echo of a thought, sent directly into the neural processing systems we had been using to analyze the data. Several members of the research team reported experiencing it simultaneously, a sudden overwhelming sensation of being seen, of being understood, of being judged. One scientist described it as a voice without sound. Another said it felt like a presence brushing against the edges of her mind. I myself felt it, and I can tell you it was unlike anything I have ever experienced. It wasn't hostile. It wasn't benevolent. It was neutral clinical, as if we were specimens under a microscope. NASA immediately classified the event. They locked down the lab. They confiscated personal devices. They made us sign agreements that we would not speak about what we had experienced. But I'm telling you now because I believe you have a right to know. I believe humanity has a right to know that we are not alone and that we have been cataloged by intelligences far beyond our comprehension. The question we are now grappling with, the question that keeps the world's top scientists awake at night, is this. What are they going to do with that information? There are theories. Some believe 3i Atlas is part of a vast network, a galactic surveillance system designed to monitor emerging civilizations. Others think it's a probe from an ancient AI, a remnant of a long dead civilization that continues to carry out its programming across the eons. And then there are those who believe something far more unsettling. They believe we are in quarantine, that humanity has been identified as a potential threat, a species on the verge of technological adolescence, capable of great creation but also great destruction. And 3i Atlas is here to determine whether we are worthy of joining the galactic community or whether we should be contained. I have spent my entire career believing in the fundamental goodness of discovery, in the idea that knowledge, no matter how challenging, is always preferable to ignorance. But now, standing on the edge of this revelation, I am no longer sure. Because what if the truth is not liberating? What if the truth is a door we were never meant to open? We like to think of ourselves as intelligent. We build cities. We create art. We split the atom and peer into the hearts of stars. But what if intelligence is not a singular thing? What if it exists on a spectrum so vast that we are barely at the beginning? What if, to the minds that built 3i Atlas, we are no more sophisticated than ants building a mound? And yet they are watching us. They are studying us. They are mapping the way we think, the way we dream, the way we love and fear and hope. Why? What could they possibly want from us? I have considered many possibilities. Perhaps they are scientists, observing the natural evolution of consciousness in the universe. 
Perhaps they are archivists, recording the rise and fall of civilizations as a cosmic library. Or perhaps they are something else entirely, something we don't have words for, something that exists in dimensions of thought and reality we have yet to discover. There is a concept in physics called the anthropic principle. It suggests that the universe is the way it is, because if it were any different, we wouldn't be here to observe it. It's a kind of cosmic selection bias. But what if there's another principle at work? What if the universe is teeming with intelligence, but only certain kinds of intelligence are allowed to persist? What if there is a filter, a test, and three, I, Atlas, is the examiner? The data suggests that it's not just mapping our thoughts randomly. It's focused. It's measuring something specific. Pattern recognition, problem solving, emotional complexity, empathy, aggression, cooperation, all the traits that define us as a species, all the traits that will determine whether we survive the next century or destroy ourselves before we ever leave this pale blue dot. And here's the part that terrifies me. The data shows that 3i Atlas is not just observing, it's comparing, cross-referencing, as if it has done this before, as if we are not the first species it has evaluated. What happened to the others? Did they pass the test? Or are their worlds now silent, erased by their own hand or by something else? I think about the Fermi paradox often, the haunting question. If the universe is so vast, so old, so full of potential for life, then where is everyone? Why haven't we heard from them? Why are the stars so quiet? Perhaps the answer is simpler and darker than we imagined. Perhaps they are silent because they didn't pass the test. Perhaps the galaxy is a graveyard of civilizations that were found wanting. And now it's our turn. I want to believe we will pass. I want to believe that humanity, for all its flaws, for all its violence and ignorance and selfishness, has something unique, something worth preserving. Our art, our music, our stories, our capacity for love, our relentless curiosity, our refusal to accept the darkness without lighting a candle. But belief is not enough. We must prove it. And I fear we are running out of time. Since the discovery of the thought mapping phenomenon, NASA has been working around the clock to understand the full scope of 3i Atlas's capabilities. We now know that it has not left our solar system. Despite predictions that it would slingshot around the sun and disappear into the void, it has remained. Loitering, orbiting in the outer reaches beyond Neptune, still transmitting, still watching. And the signals have intensified. In the last two weeks, we have detected a surge in activity. The emissions have become more more frequent, more complex. It's as if 3i Atlas has completed its initial survey and is now compiling a report, sending its findings somewhere. To whom we don't know, we can't trace the destination. The signal is directional, aimed at a point in deep space we have no hope of reaching with our current technology. But whoever is on the receiving end, they are learning everything about us. Our fears, our dreams, our potential, our limits. I was asked by a colleague recently if I regretted being part of this discovery. If I wished I could go back to a time when I believed we were alone, insignificant perhaps, but safe in our isolation. And I thought about it. I thought about it for a long time. And my answer is no. Because the universe does not care about our comfort. It does not care about our fear. The universe simply is. And if we are to survive, if we are to evolve, we must face it with open eyes, no matter what we find. But I will admit this, I am afraid, not of the unknown. I have spent my life embracing the unknown. I am afraid of what the known might reveal. I am afraid that we are not ready, that we have been found before we found ourselves. Humanity stands at a threshold. We have the capability to reach for the stars, to become a spacefaring civilization, to join the cosmic community. But we also have the capability to annihilate ourselves, to poison our world, to fracture into tribalism and hatred. And three, I Atlas is watching, measuring, recording every choice we make. It's a mirror held up to our species. And the reflection is not always flattering, but perhaps that's the point. Point. Perhaps the test is not whether we are perfect, but whether we are willing to grow, whether we can recognize our flaws and choose collectively to be better, to transcend our limitations, to prove that intelligence, when coupled with compassion and wisdom, can create something beautiful. I think often of Carl Sagan, my friend and mentor, who once said that we are a way for the cosmos to know itself, that through us, the universe becomes conscious. And I wonder now if that's what 3i Atlas is really measuring, not just intelligence but awareness, self-awareness, the ability to look at ourselves honestly and ask, 
Who are we? Who do we want to be? Those are not easy questions, but they are essential ones. As I sit here tonight, looking up at the stars, I am struck by a thought that brings me both terror and hope. We are not alone. We never were. And somewhere out there beyond the edge of our perception, someone is deciding our fate. Not with weapons or threats, but with knowledge, with understanding. And the verdict will not be handed down by force, but by revelation. What will they see when they look at us? What will the data show? What will the mapping of our thoughts reveal about the species called humanity? I don't know, but I believe this channel, this conversation, this shared search for truth is part of the answer. Follow this journey with us as we continue decoding the universe's final warnings, because the story is not over. It has only just begun. And now I ask you, as I asked at the beginning, tell me your city. Tell me what you've seen, because the universe is speaking and we need to listen. But here is the question that will haunt me until the day I die. The question I leave with you tonight. If we are being mapped, measured, and judged by intelligences beyond our comprehension, what do we want them to find?